Welcome back to Monday Musings, a casual conversation about culture and theology. I'm Justin Ely. And I'm Daniel Chen. We're a couple guys talking about some stuff. And the stuff we're talking about today is both um, sad and uh, filled with a lot of gratitude, but we are remembering Tim Keller, who uh, passed away last Friday and um, met his Savior face-to-face that he loved and preached about for many years. So uh, he has impacted both of us in a variety of ways, and I'm very grateful for him. So we want to talk about him and remember him today. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things, um, especially probably for you, because, you know, I, I really, you know, I was influenced by Tim Keller, but I feel like you really, he meant a lot. He to, was probably my, my greatest mentor from afar. Yeah. Like the person that influenced me the most that I never met. Yeah. Except kind of on that Zoom call one time that I took a screenshot of. Yeah. It, and, it, <laughs> and it kind of reminds me of um, the podcast we did long ago when when Kobe Bryant died and why sure. that felt so personal. Sure. But I feel like there's a little bit of that for a lot of people where it feels like they impacted, where he impacted their life so much. It was almost like a, a friend passing away yeah you know? he he was like a spiritual father to so many people in a variety of ways um so we want to talk about him his legacy how he impacted us um how we benefited from him uh but we want to start with our resource of the month and our resource of the month is tim keller <laughs> uh in in honor of this great man we're i'm going to post the amazon link uh to his like amazon page the man was a writer, goodness, and he really didn't start writing until about 15 years ago. Really? I mean, he he waited until toward the end of his career. Yeah. Um, he jokingly said he consciously chose not to publish something when he was young because he knew he might change his mind and didn't want to embarrass himself. Really? Um, so he waited till later on to write. I think some of them were reworked sermons and stuff that probably had happened years before but um yeah most of most people don't recognize that tim keller really didn't come on the scene until you know a little before 2010 around 2008 or so um that's wild so i mean he he's he's done a lot in in a little over a decade of, of writing but yeah that's our resource of the month tim keller so as we kind of remember Tim Keller, reflect on his legacy uh, and his his person, um, when were you first introduced to Tim Keller? Do you remember? Probably, probably around 2008, 2008 yeah. or 2009. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, we were talking about which resource did he influence most. So, uh, you know, it was the idea, if you've read Prodigal God, I know you have, Justin. But, yeah. Um, I was going through a Galatians study that he wrote. Okay, yeah, Galatians so, for you or whatever that yeah. blue book. Yes, yeah. it was. Okay, yeah. I didn't. I didn't know how to name. I just called it the <laughs> Galatians study. Yeah, it was. That was really popular in probably most college ministries, but especially campus outreach back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Maybe it was nine, nine or ten, because Meredith did it too. Mm. Um, but that idea of me being the older brother. Yeah, I, I know that's like. <laughs> and we'll get to people critiquing Tim Keller. I know that's a critique of people in the past is that it's not just about the older brother. Of course it's not. Right. But it, it, it introduces an idea in that story that I've heard a million times growing up. Yeah. That I never related much to the younger brother. Sure. Um, not from like an outward perspective. Right. Man, really changed my life. Yeah. Uh, and my, the way I thought about my relationship with God. Yeah. And so... Um, yeah, so it was around, you know, 08, 09, 2010. Yeah, I was introduced to him. That's what about you? Interesting. Yeah, I was I was thinking about this because so my my like, you know, grew up United Methodist and it moved shifted toward kind of a reform Baptist theology toward the end of college, largely through the influence of John Piper. Cuz uh, John Piper was invited to the Passion Conference and I'd go to the Passion Conference and um, I don't think I knew about Tim Keller. I mean, maybe I heard a little bit of him in those college years. Not, not a lot. Well, you were um, you were still Methodist then. So. Yeah, so I, I couldn't have 
Um, it was the first Gospel Coalition conference was 2007. Okay. And he published Prodigal God, I think, 08 or 09 or something. Um, so it, it was, I took a job at uh, Peachtree Corners Baptist in 2014. And I feel like my three years at PCBC, people laughed at me as like the, you know, mini Tim Keller, because I'd quote him in almost every sermon I preached. So I think I started reading him around 2013 or 14. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think the first sermon of his that I listened to was from a Gospel Coalition conference. It was the getting out sermon. It was the story of the Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea. And I had never heard, like, Christ-centered preaching from the Old Testament like that. Mm. And um, so I think that was my first introduction. And then it was like Counterfeit Gods and Prodigal God. Those two books were hugely impactful for me. And then we read Center Church, I think, when we were planning the church. I, I think we read the whole book, me, you, and John Wood. That must have been 13 or 14, I, right? I think it was. Yeah, so... Um, Man, that book is way ahead of its time. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and then I, you know, I li- listened to a variety of um, sermons of his throughout the the years. Yeah. So, how do you think he impacted you the most as a pastor or Christian? Or yeah. So I mean, obviously, mainly through his books. Um, yeah. And I was thinking about my favorite book of his that he wrote, and it's probably Counterfeit Gods. Yeah, it's so um, good. about heart idols. Yeah, because once again, that concept was revolutionary to me. Me too. And to be able to identify them and to actually worship God, right? And so, uh, but I, I think, um, yeah, there's many ways uh, that that he has influenced me. So. Particularly that book, Counterfeit Gods. I think the way he was able to read the culture yeah. was amazing. Yep. Um, and to speak into it. And the fact that he could grow a church in New York uh, yeah. to the size it was, I mean, just speaks to the gifting that God had, had given him. Sure. Right? And I think, too, like, um, it's interesting because you have a lot of people— yeah, I guess a lot of people don't know, maybe not think about this, but there's a lot of young pastors that go into the ministry wanting to change the world, right? Wanting to make this huge spa- splash, this yep. huge impact. And some do become famous, and most of them fall. Yeah. And I think because of that, you know, my goal, like I think it's just about Hebrews 12, just I'm just trying to finish the race here. Finish the race. And I think Tim, like... I, you know, I don't know him, but it didn't really sound like he was like, I'm going to change the world. You yeah. know, I'm like, it's going to be about me. I just think he humbly did ministry. For, I mean, the fact that he waited until he was, what, 58 before he published a book or whatever. Like, yeah, I guess something. Like, people didn't even know who he was, essentially. No. Like, you know. Outside of, like, New York City or the PCA, no one really knew who he was until yeah, 2007. Yeah, he, he just humbly put his head down, did yep. ministry, cared for people, shared the gospel, led people to faith. And finished with no, like, controversy. Yep. Like, in the sense of what you would normally think of past your controversy. You know, like, there's no sexual scandal, no abuse of power, no, you know. Like, he retired a few years ago and kept speaking and doing, and it was just kind of like he transitioned off being the pastor, right, of that church. And uh, I'm like, I think that's what... um, you know, I don't know if a lot of people would say that, but the fact that he just humbly served the Lord and then finished the race well mm-hmm. is uh, might seem boring, but uh, is almost a miraculous feat in today's age. That is like sad and true all at the same time. Yeah. I remember when I was going through church planting assessment, he had just announced he was going to basically retire as senior pastor redeemer and step into like a mentoring role for, for younger pastors, basically. And the church... Uh, planting assessor was like, look, guys, you can finish like Tim Keller. You can, like, have a ministry filled with integrity, finish well, and ride off into the sunset. You don't have to follow the destructive path of so many people you see. Yeah. And that was a gift just to see someone finish well with integrity, not have any kind of scandal, you know. Um, 
I think I think of him a, f- a few things. One, um, obviously, like his preaching has greatly impacted my preaching and how how to preach the gospel in every text and how to mm. see Christ in every text. And I think you know, in in the seeker sensitive movement that we experienced, like as kids, there was such a um, heavy emphasis on application driven preaching. Mm give people a how-to guide, you know? And then Keller comes in, and he's like, the main goal of the sermon is for people to see Jesus as beautiful. And he would always quote his wife, Kathy, who would say, if people are still taking notes at the end of your sermon, you've done it wrong. Mm. That you want the pins to go down and the hearts to go up at the end as you lift Jesus up. And he always did that. He did that so well. And so so much so that in one of my preaching classes in seminary, it was a, a thing called Christ-centered preaching, how to do it. <laughs> and it was like 10 steps or whatever. And one of the steps was, don't try to be Tim Keller. He's just better than all of us. You, you can't do it, you know? Uh, but his impact on my preaching, I use his outline every week uh, for how to bring out the gospel. Um, so that that's an indelible mark. I don't think we'd exist as a church if it weren't for him. I mean, his he inspired a whole generation of church planters. He did. Mm-hmm. And uh, he made church planting mainstream. Right. And I don't know if, if we would have been inspired to plant Christ Fellowship. Yeah, there's an inspiration for there for sure. Yeah, and I, w- yeah. I would say most young church planters today, if, you, if you're in your— 20s, 30s, or, or maybe even 40s, and you planted a church in America, Tim Keller was probably at least a partial inspiration to you, if not a really big one. Yeah. That that impacted me a lot. Um, like you said, his cultural analysis. Um, and his heart, his heart for apologetics was never an end in itself. It was always to get to evangelism. Yeah. Which I always really appreciated. You, yeah, and I think that distinction is important because he's not just, yeah, it, it, he's he's so evangelistic. He wants like to I get to Christ. He's not just trying to give you some, you know, smart proofs or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and I just you know like, yeah, I, I don't want to like throw like Rick Warren on the bus here, but you know his like whole right. like I've discipled. 10 yeah. million pastors or whatever. Right. I'm like, I actually can't imagine how many people Tim Keller let, let to faith. Yeah. And it's like, none of us know anything about it because he just... Just quietly did it. He just quietly did it. And yeah. it wasn't about... He wasn't trying to win a fight. He wasn't yep. trying to, like, you know, it wasn't just about the correction. Yeah. The end goal was always Jesus. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think that comes out into... Like, I was just reading like what his son posted, but one of the last things he said was, you know, I'm thankful for the time God has given me, but I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus send me home. Yeah. How I beautiful. Mean, that that like encompasses, I think, his, his life, life. His ministry. Yeah. Right. And uh what was the there was another quote I read something about like like there's nothing to be sad about or something. Oh you know yeah. What I'm talking about? Um he said um me leaving uh, it's something like that. There's, there's nothing bad that can come from me leaving. Yeah, uh, you know, and just, just the sure confidence in the resurrection um, was an amazing, amazing thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for um, his, his marriage to Kathy. Yeah, um, just seemed to. Someone was pointing out a lot of reflections are being written about him. Someone was pointing out he didn't seem to be able to get through a conversation or a sermon without talking about Kathy in some way. And it was never negative, always glowing, always positive. And just a, what a beautiful example of a yeah. partnership, of a marriage. Um, also reflecting on the value of institutions in building something that's not dependent upon you. Yep. So Keller planted um, Redeemer, and then they started noticing... Um, People weren't crossing Central Park to go to church. It was way too much of a distance. So they they planted another on the other side of Central Park and then another one downtown. And they started these um, campuses. But instead of doing what most mega church churches do, which is beam in the lead pastor live, 
they started raising up a, the lead pastors of each campus, and Keller would bounce. They would all preach the same sermon, same text. Keller would bounce around and wouldn't tell anyone which which service he was going to be at um, because they didn't want to build it on him. So you didn't know who was going to be Keller or not. Yeah. And then toward the last part of his ministry, they split off into individual churches. And so what's amazing is so many mega churches. once the founder leaves or dies, mm-hmm. the thing falls apart. Yeah. He didn't build Redeemer that way. So he he built a really, and then they just keep planting churches in New York. It's crazy. So he did Redeemer. Then you have the Gospel Coalition, which he helped start 2007, I think, with Don Carson, self-perpetuating institution. Mm. Then Redeemer City to City, which has planted, I think, thousands of churches around the world. Hope for New York, which helps um, Mercy Ministry in New York City. Uh, the a Redeemer Counseling Network. Um, goodness, what else is there? Uh, there's just a variety of institutions that he directly started or helped start uh, that he spun off in such a way that wasn't dependent upon him. Hmm. And I think that there's a lot of wisdom for us to glean from that. Yeah. Um, but I think the thing that I've been reflecting on the most with him <laughs> is like, and this is pretty amazing, at the end of the day, what I like most appreciate isn't his mind, isn't his preaching ability, isn't his institution building capacity, isn't his church planting prowess, which all all of those are amazing things. The thing I've been reflecting on the most is his gentleness. Hmm. And I, I read this tweet the other day that someone was like, you know, I used to want to be like Tim Keller and be this nationally recognized, you know, influential figure. Yeah. And he said, now I just want to be gentle like he is. Hmm. And, you know, he was just, whether it was how he engaged with non-Christians who had objections, in just this gentle way, he he helped express and understand their argument <clears throat> better than they could. Right. And then he was never demeaning, never talked down, very gentle with him. And then we'll get into this. He He had a number of people that were pretty mad at him all the time that theological opponents um that he was always just very gentle and kind with on social media when they were not gentle or kind with him yeah you know and it's interesting with that too because i think people took his gentleness as weakness sometimes yeah in terms of like why aren't you stronger against yeah this and if you actually just read and listen to what he actually believed he was as orthodox as it gets pretty much oh my gosh and yeah. and i don't even mean theologically i mean yeah. he was like like socially conservative too yeah and but he was just very gentle in how he approached everything and i think people sometimes took it as like weakness or he was or that he agreed with the other side when in reality i think he's just a gentle guy yeah yeah, but that's also how he won so many people over too. Yeah. So, what what do you think? Because we were talking about this before we recorded things that we can learn from. <laughs> you had people that, I mean, they people uniquely love to trash on Tim Keller on like Twitter. Yeah, is the strangest thing. Uh, but everyone's silent now. Right. No one's, tra- you know, so what, it was what, like, what do we, where, where are the haters, right? Yeah. Where'd you go? And I think where the haters were are, is that everyone, all believers really knew he was a brother. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but like when a, a true heretic dies, <laughs> I bet people are still going to trash on them. Right. You know I mean? Maybe right. not in a, re- like, uh, like, you know, I mean, I think people would say something like, e- even if it was, you know, it's sad that he died, but he led people astray. You know, sure, like people are gonna, like that. people yeah. are gonna send stuff. No one's saying that about Tim Keller. Yeah, everyone, all of his critics are silent because they know he's a brother. Yeah, and I think, you know, what what I want to say and what I've been thinking about is, it is fine to critique each other. Yeah, at brothers and sisters in Christ, it's fine to disagree with one another. But the stuff that people were saying about him were straight up just, like, sinful. 
Like it was crazy. Yeah, it was just it it was like personal attacks on his character and yeah, like uh, you know I'm you of course you have a, a spectrum right. Some people were just critiquing him, but some people were like attacking him. Attack might be yeah. the word I would go for, and I would say, look, don't wait until the man dies to be silent instead right. of attacking him. Yeah, I think we can learn that gentleness and sometimes the best thing to say is nothing. Yeah. And uh, like, I, I think this is one of the, I don't know. I know social media can do a lot of good, but it's just kind of like, okay, well, even if you have the best critique in the world, what's he going to do? Like read it on Twitter and then you change his mind or right. whatever. It's kind of like, I just don't understand what the point <laughs> yeah. is. Right. And um I think there's just something to like learning how to treat your brothers and sisters in Christ before they die. Yeah. I bet there's a lot of people that maybe regret their tweet. Sure. Um, now that yeah. he's not here anymore. Yeah. And don't do that. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know what I mean? And, and once again, like if you want to critique him or feel like, okay, he said something that you think might be harmful f- in this part of the culture or whatever, and you want to say it back, that's fine. That, that happened a lot too. Yeah. But there were people who attacked him. Yeah. And that was just unnecessary. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, well, and I, I think too, like, um, you know, <laughs> we we have to get past this whole, like, um, you need to agree with everything about someone to appreciate them and, and learn from them. Right. Like, so like Tim Keller in um, The Reason for God opens up the door to theistic evolution, you know? I don't love that. I'd prefer that not be in the book. I wish he didn't open the door to that. I think it's problematic. Okay. So am I Am I going to throw everything away from him because right. he, he does that? Like, And I feel like some people were that way. Be, because you don't have the same view on Genesis 1 to 11 that I do. Yeah. I'm throwing out the entirety of your 40 years of ministry, all your books. I'm not going to read anything because I know this one thing about you and I'm done. Right. Um, I just don't think that's a great way. I mean, at, at what point you're going to throw everyone out Right. at, at, at some point. If you're going to act that way. Yeah, sure. And um, you, you would throw this podcast out. F- right. To, there's no way our, our listeners agree with everything we've said. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. So so I've even, <laughs> I mean, people have even asked me before, you know, are you aware of, of Tim Keller's belief on, you know, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> do, do, do I believe that? No. Am I Tim Keller? No, I'm not. I don't. Right. I can appreciate him and, and his ministry and, and so much about him. Um, it, and have disagreements, I, you know. Yeah, and it, it comes down to, you. we talked about this too, like one tweet that he writes or one, you know, one paragraph in a book that he wrote is what, like point zero 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 whatever <laughs> one of his life. Yeah. Like, why don't we take the other 99.9999% and make our judgment? Instead yep. of judging on the point zero 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 right. one of his life, right? Right. And of course, like if he said so, if that thing is like Jesus is not God, okay, I'm yeah, with you. You're a heretic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if it's you know like, I wish he would have said this in 2020 when race stuff was going on. Right. I'm like, come on, like you yeah. know, like that was one tweet. I mean, Pe- people were in in 2020 because so, so some people would have called him woke or whatever. I think that's kind of a – if you read his, uh, like, massive paper on critical theory, I I think you will find him to be a very unwoke person. Yeah, he's not. Um, yeah, that's but, the thing. Uh, but people were trashing on him in 2020 for, like, you didn't, you didn't tweet about the Black Lives Matter movement and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he's like – months later came out and he's like, hey, guys, uh, I saw that some of you were critiquing me for, you know, not uh, not commenting on this. I was actually in, in a hospital bed being treated for pancreatic cancer at the time, so I wasn't really able to tweet. It's like, <laughs> come, on, like come on. You know, it's like we assume the worst in people. You know, the dude was getting, like, treatment for yeah. pancreatic cancer. Um, uh, it, yeah, I'm just saying, like, let's let's take the whole body of work. And no, you don't. You do not have to agree 100% with anyone. Yeah. You just don't have to. Yeah. 
Sure, you got to draw a hard line in the sand somewhere. Sure, and and I would say primary theology things. Yeah, right. Great, yeah. draw the hard line there. Yeah, but um, you know, there's there's things you can learn from from anyone. In, yeah, in, in, essentially, you know, especially brothers in Christ. Like I, I, I'm specifically speaking about people who are clearly brothers in Christ. Like sure. we are going to see Tim Keller in heaven. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if that is the person that you're talking to, remember that as you're... Remember your family ties. Yeah. Yeah. As you're, as you're speaking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of transitioning into, you know, how he'll be remembered or, or legacy to uh, leave forward. I, just a few comments on... Um, I'm looking at his book list. Most recent was forgive we did a three or four part podcast series on that book yeah um the reason for god is an amazing apologetics book maybe even a better one is actually making sense of god which deals with like our quest for justice our quest for meaning our quest for identity really good um jesus the king amazing book on the gospel of mark we've been using it as a commentary uh, throughout prodigal God and counterfeit gods are, I'd say, great starter books of his. Two longer ones that are really fantastic: Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. I've heard that's great. Cannot recommend enough. Uh, Hillary and I started reading that when we were dealing with infertility. Very, very helpful book. And his book on prayer, long book, awesome. Fantastic book. Meaning of Marriage. Meaning of We use that for premarital even, counseling. Even Justin Bieber reads it. <laughs> read it. There was like a picture of him really? like when he was engaged to Haley, his wife, and he's like holding like... Meaning of Marriage. Meaning of Marriage. <laughs> it, it's a really good... That's what we use for our premarital counseling. Two devotional books of his that are, are great are his devotional book on Proverbs and Psalms. Um... Hope in Times of Fear, his book on the resurrection and the meaning of Easter was awesome. Great stuff. Yeah, I mean, just so many, so many good things. That's crazy how many books he read, wrote in 15 years. I'm sure Isn't he wrote some nuts? of them beforehand, but. Right. Like, He's just cranking them out. Man, my goal in life is to never write a book. Yeah. Like, I'm like I, don't, I don't know. I don't have much to say that. I mean, <laughs> someone else has already said it better, you know? Uh, how, how do you think he'll be. As we kind of wrap things up, how do you think he'll be remembered uh, in the future? I I mean, I think this podcast that we just are recording right now is a great summary. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like for his gentleness and his evangelism and his, like, godly character and how he influenced a whole generation— yeah, towards church planting. I, I think that is how he'll be remembered, you know? Yeah. Um, I think he's like the C.S. Lewis of our generation in mm-hmm. many ways. Um, he's America's John Stott. Um, People like to hate on C.S. Lewis, too. Oh, yeah. And, and, and he had some problematic views, you know? And his views were much more problematic, right, right. in my opinion. <laughs> right. So Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I think... Um, I think what's interesting, Tim Keller's going to be quoted in 100 years. Yeah. Pastors and theologians will be quoting him in 100 years. And most most pastors today, th- that will not be the case. Um, John Piper will probably stand the test of time to a good deal. Um, but he... But Tim Keller did so much more like cultural analysis than Piper. Mm-hmm. I think Keller will probably, honestly, have maybe a longer shelf life in in, in certain regards. Uh, Piper's like theology, uh, in, in some of his just exegesis of text may last longer. Right. Um, but I think both of them will be quoted and and resourced. People will be reading Keller's books for a very very long time. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, you know, I I was just thinking to like, you know, he was seventy three. Is that right? Um, but he was still young. I don't know. Yeah, I, I was hoping you know? for another decade plus of yeah. writing and teaching and it, wisdom. I as we enter into this, like, I, I think we're in the middle of a cultural shift. Yeah, 
I was hoping for his help to guide us I through. I would love to. He, yeah, like, I'm going to be 55 one day, and ben, and I think I'll be like, I wish I could hear what Ke- Tim Keller has to say about how to interact yes. with this. You yeah. Know? So. Yeah. So, great man, great life, great legacy. It's a reminder, you know, that um, death is coming for us all. I mean, I, I, yeah. I don't know. And and uh, all right, see you guys later. <laughs> see you next week. Uh, we'll all stand before the Lord one day, and I think it's a good, um, you know, the, the 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 writing that came out was Tim Keller passed away, you know, clinging on to the sure hope of the resurrection, and you know, is is that you? Like, are yeah. are you clinging on to the sure hope of Christ? Is Christ your sure and steady anchor? Um, if you died tonight, would you have confidence um, yeah. that you, you'd you be able to stand before God? And you certainly can't on your own record, um, but you, you can most certainly on Christ. And I think Tim showed us a life of what it meant to cling to Christ as your only hope in life and death. Yeah. And that's what he lived, and that's what he preached, and that might be the greatest takeaway for, for all of us. So... I look forward to finally getting to meet him in heaven. Yeah. I told Hillary years ago we were at a Gospel Coalition conference, and we were at a breakout session that he was teaching. We were a few rows back, and she was like, go introduce yourself. And I was like, no, he's too busy. Like, I don't. And she's like, no, go talk to him. And I didn't do it. And now because I didn't listen to my wife, I'm going to have to wait until heaven to meet Tim Keller. Mm. So. But, uh, you know, as Jan Forrester, one of our former members, she'd always say, in just kind of this joyful and flippant way, when she was moving to Birmingham, she's like, all right, well, see y'all in heaven. <laughs> um, and it is, it's, it's a great, joyful reminder. That, it is, yeah. Um, it's not goodbye. Yeah. It's see you later. Yeah. And uh, if, if you're in Christ. The gospel so. is not just a story. It is a story. It's not just a story. Yeah. It has real world, real eternal consequences. Yeah. 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 It's good. Well, thanks for joining us to reflect on Tim Keller. Uh, We'll be back next week to continue our series on the TechWise family.